back. We've talked what, we've talked why, we've talked how, and today we're going to get into motivation, which on the surface kind of seems obvious, right? But why is motivation important as a strength and conditioning coach? The service industry, you work with people. And when you really think about the dynamic that plays out for most strength and conditioning coaches is the realization that you have to get people to do things they either can't or won't. Right. They can't do it for whatever reason. Right. They either lack the the biomechanics or the capabilities physically or physiology wise. So if that was the case, if they could do all those things, then they wouldn't need you. And then the other end of it is they won't. Right. They lack the motivation or the discipline. They might be able to do it in spurts and they won't do it over a long enough period of time or with enough frequency or doing it with enough focus on technique and execution to actually yield something and your value prop is the very much uh, what you know but it's really how much you can get someone to get what you know to do over a period of time to actually get results and it's a paradigm shift if you think about it from what you probably got into this industry for right because you probably could and you're probably capable or wanted to and the realization that you're now Working with people who are in a lot of ways opposite is draining, right? You know, the old notion of you're the product of the five people you hang out with most and you're surrounded with a bunch of people who are not like-minded with having a strong desire and ability to change your performance or your body composition and the realization that all the people you work with need you for, for some functional reason. And it gets back into your why. This notion of your why will get you through pretty much any realization because your mission is so strong and your purpose behind that mission is so clear and delineated that when you realize, oh, wow, the money's in people who can or won't or the opportunities in people who can or won't, and that's where I really bring value, that, va- that why, that purpose, that mission – that will come out and their lack thereof will see a dwindling level of effort and a dwindling level of interest and more frustration and more struggle than a lot of things. So it's not transactional, right? You think about people who take on strength conditioning or personal training in between something they really want to do, right? It's easy money, quote unquote, and attributing that to something like serving, like being a bartender or a uh, waiter in some regard. That is a one-off. You're probably not going to see those customers on a reoccurring basis. So you're more inclined to have these short-term, very, very passing moments of energy enthusiasm. But now imagine seeing that same person feeding them the same meal three, four days a week at 5.30 in the morning for 8 to 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. You can see the staff there is completely burnt out and disenfranchised. They're not that super stoked about giving you the best quality meal you ever had eight weeks into a semester. And I think that part is, I'm not trying to be diminishing or devaluing of that profession or that vocation. It's just a realization that you probably going off this in the wrong pretenses if you don't have a really good why and understanding of what you want to do with this. And that dynamic of when you realize you're at that critical threshold of now I'm only facing people who can or won't. And then I always go into the what, why continuum of, well, what do you want to do? I want to work with elite level populations. Why do you want to do it? I want to help them. Well, they don't need much help. And if they, they're already capable of doing it or they have a strong desire to do it. So what value do you bring? What value do you bring that person? Well, I have an incredible knowledge. Okay. I have an incredible skill set. Okay. You're in the one percentile or the 99th percentile in terms of skill and knowledge. You probably can make a living. But if you're not, you're going to struggle. And then you're going to fall into this median percentile of clientele that are kind of half motivated with very moderate ability. And your willingness to get someone to do something or get them to want to do something is what really determines your ultimate value. And then you got to look at your skill and knowledge is still critical and important, but your motivation is equally, if not more so important to do that time and time again. Because the reality is the nature of the beast, it's not the average of what people are evaluating you on or what they're paying you on or what they're going to continue to pay you on. It's the beginning and the end. Can you convince them early on that you have a high capacity to help them? And then at the end, did you or did you not finish what the, you were set out to do and being able to push people to that, that result that they so coveted?
that will be the deciding factor whether you can keep making a living off of that. And if you can't because you've lost motivation, you're never really going to be able to access the skill and knowledge you've obtained. That will be a struggle for the rest of your career. So aside from having a really strong solidified why, what are some like techniques to help with motivation? Because you know, for those listening and that don't know, it can be a real grind. And you're in the meat grinder day in, day out, serving that same meal three to four days a week. So what are some tips for coaches out there? Have a low cost, a low investment, a low actual threshold environment to test whether you really want to do it. So for instance, most of the team sector strength and conditioning coaches will have to volunteer an intern. One of the things that you find is the people that start off close, you get a pretty good gauge on their willingness to do it, right? When you're accepting interns for your internship program, you look at the proximity in which you're at, and it's a little less skin in the game if they are living in the city or the town that you are working in. The ones that are moving all the way across the country are going to be a little bit more at risk for a, a potential, I don't really know what I got myself into, I'm burnt out, and now I'm potentially a liability. What you want to find early on with a intern coordinator is if it's your first internship, you shouldn't be in a place to say no to someone who's willing to give free help, but you shouldn't also put them in a situation where they're going to potentially be vulnerable to making a bad decision they don't really fully know what they're getting into. So start off local. And it might not be at a major Power 5 college or a professional sports team. It might be working with high school athletes. It might be working at the local junior college. It might be working with just general populations in the area to get experience and really decide whether you want to do this as a, as a job or not. And then that leads into how do you evaluate that internship? One of the big chapters I talked about in How to Become a Strength Coach, the book, was that, hey, you get to July 4th weekend in college football, strength conditioning summer training, and you see a different intern in the second half of the summer than you saw the first. And that unfortunately becomes what you're remembered as. That's your legacy, is the person who burnt out. We default to the lowest form of what someone does. It just naturally, especially when it comes to a very competitive environment where I have a line of resumes at the door to get the next group of interns in, you're going to get whitewashed in terms of this view of, all right, that person wasn't really that good or didn't work that hard and didn't have a strong motivation. Yeah, June, they came out swinging, but they didn't finish. And that ability to finish through would tell you, you probably need to either find a thing that you're willing to do after a little bit of break where you're really going to have to be in the threshold and push through. You're, you're going to have to sacrifice some things like going to bed a little bit earlier, doing some meal prep, being disciplined, being structured. It might come at the expense of your personal training, right? So, hey, I really just love the lift. I don't care about anything else. Being on your feet for six, eight hours a day, coaching other people, burns you out, gets you tired, gets you sore, gets you not wanting to train or exercise. Probably the last thing you want to do is train or exercise in a place that you just spend an inordinate amount of time in. And then you lose the romanticism associated with why you like this in the first place. That's a pretty clear indicator. And what I would say in that regard is not only having a low cost associated with learning whether you want to do this or not, but having these indicators, are you trying to find more reasons to do this based off of a high affinity for it? Or are you trying to find more reasons not to do it based off a strong lack there of interest? And I think that tells you a lot. You could be this person that's living to work and strength conditioning will be your haven. It is an escape from all these things that you've been, you feel like socially awkward or outcast in. You know, there's usually a, an archetype that resonates with the weight room, whether it's, I have a strong work ethic. I believe I can build myself into the person or the athlete I always wanted to be, or this person that just never really clicked or connected anywhere. The focus on developing yourself, going into these kind of like basement garage, like gyms and just coming out as a transformed human, right? That image of Charles Atlas and the bully kicking sand on the guy who's not really that strong or developed and takes the girl. And that guy goes home and works out in his garage and becomes the man that he always aspired to be. That resonates with a lot of strength and conditioning coaches, whether you realize it or not. Like when you get to a Rocky movie and you fast forward to the montage scene, you're not paying attention to the other stuff, but the other stuff is probably the, the politics, the bureaucracy, the conflict, 
that's the reality of most jobs. You're just skipping to the montage scene and you realize that majority of your job is not just the montage scene or the things that you resonate with. It's humans. It's connecting. It's working with people who can or won't. It's working with other trainers and coaches and working with other people in that either organization or department or team and collaborating and connecting and not having an ego or not being this hard to deal with person, you know, that becomes troublesome and, and burdensome. And, you know, this will be a really clear indication of whether you want to do this or not, or whether you need to change the way you approach things. And if you need to change the way you approach things and look at things, then that becomes very, very hard to do if you're not very motivated and you lack the clear understanding as to why you're doing this in the first place. You're not going to have any desire or or impetus to change. It's the the truth in terms of the outlet is probably a very low paying, long hour, big sacrifice type of job. And those who have a clear focus on what they want and why they want it typically will not even bat an eye at making under $35,000 a year living halfway across the country in a place that you never even imagined you wanted to live working 60 hours a week. If that scares you, if that realizes like, oh, wow, this is not something I want to do, you probably have already made the decision. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be a gatekeeper to strength conditioning. I'm just trying to protect people from something that they probably don't really have a clear understanding as to what they're getting into. It's not going to be a lot of money. It's going to be a lot of hours. And there's going to be a lot of people that probably don't immediately resonate with what you're asking them to do. But you win them over and you make a compelling argument as to why what, they, why what you're asking them to do is of value. You find reward from not just what you make, but what you do and who you do it for. There's whole sorts of values that we can learn from this. And the motivational aspect, it's all I would ask you to do in any scenario is once you figure out what you want to do and why you're doing it, commit. Commit with everything, mind, mind, body, and spirit, and push as hard as you can in that direction until you get to the outcome and then see what happens. In terms of evaluating a potential internship, what is something that young coaches should look for in an internship? Because a good internship experience could also play a big factor in motivation as well. So what are some things to look for as coaches are looking for that internship? I mean, this is probably the area that most people never really like to talk transparently about, but your, the network effect. Mm -hmm. What is the potential to get a job from that place? I think there's two potential places you should be looking to get employment from an internship. One directly out on site at that location. You have to look at their track record of hiring previous interns. And you have to look at their willingness to look internally at the people they got as a viable candidate for a new position. Then you look at what is the actual impact for the rest of your career and the tree that is coming off of that, finding people within the network. So you're one degree separated from the job, right? All it takes is just one good name to get your name in the mix. And the more people you are connected to and affiliated with, the more likely that will organize itself and hopefully giving you an opportunity to get your foot in the door. And then they're giving you a good reference or recommendation off of that. I think, expectations for interns are really low. And if I'm an employer and I'm looking at the next wave of people, because if I have employees or subordinates, the idea is that they're going to leave, especially if they're good and they're capable and they're aspirational and they're motivated. That's the game. It's I hire the best people possible and they're going to want to move on to a role like mine. And I'm looking at the next crop of coaches coming up through our internship program as a viable candidate. And you're looking at this as an intern saying, okay, well, what is the potential for me to get a job here if there was a position? And if they're like, no, nah, no, nah, you don't deserve it. You don't earn it. Well, you don't know that. You have no idea what my capability, what my work ethic is, or, you know, maybe I do have an opportunity to earn a job here. I want to prove that to you. And if there's a track record of giving equal, op equal opportunity to everyone, I think that's something. The expectation that this internship program should give you some sort of education and then being disappointed when it's not the answer, the panacea of, of training and understanding the body and, un and unified theory of everything. And it's, what did you expect? Like, what, what were you? What was the point of getting your degree if you came out of there with a strong desire to learn more? 
you know, you just basically wasted a whole lot of money, in my opinion, that if you don't have enough, at least accessibility to information or understanding how to acquire information on your own regard, you can't do some investigative work and find that, then you're going to be very, very much so struggling. Like you're what we call a baby bird looking for me to mama bird all the information into your mouth. You have to be able to absorb and acquire. And the other part, which I find really problematic, not just from a young or from an intern perspective, but from the employer, it has to be specific to the job they're supposed to do. So if I have vault, if I have body metrics, if I have FMS, if I have gym aware, those are the systems I need to develop my staff in order to be able to do. I'm, I think Hawkins, I think DEXA, I think looking at something like another velocity-based training like Perch or Vertruve are all fine and good. But I need you to be proficient and capable in the systems that I have. I don't care about teaching you how to do systems we do not have. And I think that's metaphorical for a lot of the things that interns have expectations on. But also from an employer, you have no obligation to do things outside the construct of what your program's doing. And if I don't have any need for my staff to do that, you know, let's say that we have three coaches and a thousand athletes broken up into 40 teams. Sports science, albeit, is important, but it's going to be a lot more autonomous, self driven athlete gathering based data collection. You need to learn how to manage data. You need to learn how to manage athletes to gather that data. But are you doing a high level pivot tables and breaking down that information? Probably not. I need you to be able to get on the floor and coach. I need you to be able to tell that person that didn't get their force deck over there to jump. I need you to be able to do these things. And can you or won't you? And there's a big dynamic that surrounds around some sort of educational facade that, you know, we have some sort of obligation to teach something that they don't know or impress them with more knowledge versus do I have a clear understanding of what the job is and can I reverse engineer the description in some sort of formal training system or onboarding to have that intern have a really good chance to be successful within our system. And I can further see whether they are capable of more knowledge. If you can't execute on basic remedial tasks that all of our coaches need to be able to do on some level, because when you leave, we're going to have to take up the slack in that area. You can't execute on that. You don't deserve more knowledge. That more knowledge is not going to benefit you. It's actually going to be a detriment to your development and growth. Now you need to learn how to apply it. You need to get in front of a person. You need to cue an exercise. You need to get them to change the way they do something. You need to tell them they need to do it the exact same way we prescribed it. And if they can't, you need to find some sort of solution to get them to do it or find another variation that they can do. And that takes reps. That takes courage. That takes a lot of self-confidence. And you ain't going to get that going through a more advanced curriculum. If you do have an interest outside of an internship, and I do have training systems for my interns, but it's built around what I need them to be able to do on a daily basis. I don't really care if they have a high level knowledge of table tests and other movement systems. I need them to know these things. I don't care if they have a high level knowledge of periodization and program design. I even know how to do my program and execute on my periodization. These are all the, the variables as we're looking through it. So if you're an intern looking for an internship, What's my potential to get a job either directly here or from here? And then not having any delusions that this place needs to give you more answers. It needs to put you to work and get whatever it is out of you, out of you, so you can be the best you can possibly be. And that might come in the form of a lot of remedial tasks. And that might come in the form of working with a lot of athletes who probably can't. They really want to, but they probably can't. And if you can demonstrate a high capacity to do these remedial tasks and get people to do something that they can't normally do based off everyone else not being able to get them to do it, you are valuable. And then when you start getting some money in, you can use that money to get further education and say, hey, I think we could really advance in this area. But you have no actual platform to say whether something should be more progressed in terms of education or knowledge. That's not the limiting factor here. It's skill. You have no skill at this point in your career. I'm not trying to be degrading and, and, and belittling, but you focused on the wrong thing. And I've seen this quite a bit. I thought this curriculum would be a little bit more advanced. I thought you'd be better at coaching. What do you want me to say? You know, how do we respond to that? Because I can go in a great depth, but I can't go there unless you've demonstrated capacity to do the basic job. 
what you know is probably going to be less and less valuable every single year with artificial intelligence. The gap is closing. That my knowledge base has actually become less valuable as time has gone on since artificial intelligence has come about. I could be mad about it, but I could also look at it from, well, thank God I have thousands of hours on the floor coaching and getting my reps there and knowing how to deal and interact with several different customer types, archetypes, personalities, variance in skill, age, training ability, all sorts of dynamics I can handle pretty fluidly. And that comes from just working and getting your reps and getting feedback and refining and improving. These are all really important steps. So as we're breaking down, like, hey, what's a really good litmus for you as an intern? I think you should probably, yeah, start with a place that has a really high capacity to that. But with that coming through, it's also the employer has a clear mission of our best next employee is the one who's currently here. And I have a really good sample on what their ability is over a longer period of time. You know, doing, trying to guess off an interview, no one's good at that. Statistics have proven that time and time again. You look at Angela Duxworth, grit. It's an outcome measure. She looks at West Point Beast Barracks, who makes it through, or the people who have grit, and the people who don't, don't. But you can't determine that beforehand. So the government's paying millions of dollars, bringing in a 1,000 kids every year, 30% 30, 30 of which aren't going to make it through Beast Barracks. That, and you don't have any input measure to go, oh, wow, we got to be better in filtering this to make sure all of those 1,000 kids get through there. How many first-round NFL draft, NBA or NFL or MLB bust are there? And you mean to tell me in your three-day interview you have with a strength coach that you can determine whether they're going to be a good strength coach or good fit? That person has been with me for eight to 12 weeks, on time every day, improved every day, busted their ass every day, asked them to do these basic remedial tasks and knocked it out of the park. And then when I titrated up the intensity of what their job description was, they rose to the occasion. You mean to tell me that person is not a better fit for your athletic department? Or at least when you say, wow, that person didn't cut the cut it and they didn't make it, I know that they either aren't going to make it in terms of strength conditioning or just not going to make it with us. And maybe I need to do a better job of developing coaches. There's no ownership from the top down because it's free help. For me, I always looked at it from, I have a future employee there. What would I do? How would I develop that person? How would I foster this so that person generally wants to work with me? And then on top of it could be the best possible asset in our my business or my department in the future. And as an intern, hopefully that's aspiring. Hopefully that's a great accreditation to what we're trying to accomplish in any kind of strength conditioning environment. So you just laid out really well how to be a great intern and, and what to do to set yourself apart from, from the other interns. What other habits should we be looking at maybe less on the floor in in the weight room specifically that interns should be looking at implementing to make sure they, they do excel? Have some self-confidence, and that comes from preparation. Yep. You know, I look at most internships, the reason why interns, why they fail is because they lack confidence. They're insecure about potentially the way they look or the way they are, the way they think they're being treated. And it, it's not a generational thing. Everyone's insecure leaving college. Everyone's insecure in their first experience working or interning. Everyone's insecure in a team setting or some sort of business that's been existing and there's a infrastructure and legacy has been passed down. But your preparation determines your confidence. And, you know, the funniest thing I always see, it's the, I'm going to do my own program. Really? Wow. The arrogance, yeah. right? You know, when you break that, that they break that down, and you think about how that that speaks out. Like, you so you mean to tell me that you can write a better program than I can, uh -huh. and or you know this program that well that you don't need to practice it. Like when someone's like on C one, and it's it's heels elevated, single leg quarter a split squat, and it's a four hundred one zero tempo, and it's three sets of six to eight reps with. 40 to 60% intensity because it's part of this other superset that you can just rattle that off like not even thinking about it. That level of precision and that level of understanding and subconscious application, you're there. Mm -hmm. How do you think you get that? You practice it. Mm -hmm. You do it in the work. You go in there and do the program. And you want a great way to assimilate to an environment, to connect with others, show a belief in what they're doing. 
your program is probably stupid and it's probably based off of some sort of either limited sided goal. Like if you're committing to strength conditioning, your goals are irrelevant. You need to focus on what's in front of you and making the most from the situation. If you drove 3000 miles to be in an internship, sacrificed a birth, one kidney to be able to pay for this thing. And you're telling me that you have the audacity to do your own program. Like, what does that say about you? What does that say about your commitment? What does that say if like when push comes to shove that I can really trust that you have faith in what we're doing? Are you going to undermine me? Are you going to kind of talk bad about me when uh, you're with the athletes? And you might think it's not a big deal, but it's symbolic of what you're probably going to be like as an employee. Mm -hmm. And it's not as arrogant to say that my program is universal. And I encourage my veteran staff members to experiment and and try, because I think that is one, a great opportunity to innovate your current program and what you're doing. It's also a great opportunity to evaluate, can we do what we're doing better? But early on in your career, as Mike Boyle would say, copy the recipe. Yep. You're not a chef. You're just cutting onions. So sit there and cut onions and shut your mouth. And I'm not resentful of interns. I've had pretty much all of my employees have come through an internship in some capacity. I just find it's ridiculous to say that you are better at programming or you have a, a, a program that's more specific to something that you want to do because it demonstrates you haven't made the commitment to this. And it demonstrates that you're probably not a person when it comes down to it is either that going to be trustworthy or reliable when I need them to be, right? Because it's easy to be when it's convenient. It's hard to be when you're tired or you're sluggish or you're frustrated or you're going through hardship yourself. It's also a way if like you're going to give me insight on how to do my job when you haven't done basic level of programming, you don't really fully understand what these athletes are doing. How are you going to develop empathy for your athletes? Yeah. How are you going to have empathy for what they're asking them to do? And when you get to that point of, hey, just do the program, and you know, ah, hemming and hawing, I'm not going to sit there and say I'm writing you off, but man, you better be really elite. Like you better be snatching 140, 150 kilos. You better be cleaning 170, 180 kilos. You better be back squatting 250 kilos. You better be front squatting 200 kilos. You better be deadlifting 250 kilos. You better be able to run a sub five minute mile. You better be able to jump 40 inches. You better be able to jump, broad jump 10 feet. You got to be that. And chances are, if you can do all those things, you probably shouldn't be a strength coach. You should be still competing in some capacity. Right. But it's like, until you have these benchmarks, do the program. Understand what we're doing. Then you can start to really start to ask questions about why we're doing it. And then you can be really good at it. And then when it comes down to it, of like that person has value because they're really good at what they're asked to do because they've committed and practiced. It's just trying to immerse yourself in that environment. And those are the amenities. That you're going to get a program from someone who's been doing it for 20 years at the highest level gets paid quite a bit for a lot of professional athletes and high level clientele to train them. And this program's yeah. really good. It's really well thought out. Like I, I just find that's the most interesting note when I see an intern and like their refusal to do the program, especially at their stage in their career, it's a certain level of arrogance. It's just a very interesting value that you're like, huh. That would be like a part for me that I think is really important. When you're asked to do something, do it. Yeah. Don't waver. Don't don't like hem and haw. Don't complain. Don't put it off. Don't procrastinate. Just do it. Just get the job done. Because you're not going to get the next job until you finish the first job. And if you don't mm -hmm. get the first job done, you're not going to get another job. Absolutely. There's no job too small at your role. There's jobs that could be demeaning and there's jobs that could be honestly, quite frankly, humiliating. And I don't think that's something you should tolerate. And hopefully the employers of these people who are trying to just work their way up aren't being taken advantage of. It's not indentured servitude. Mm -hmm. They volunteered. They aspire to be what we are. They have every right to be treated with humanity and dignity and with respect. But if there's a job that needs to be done and it's surface level small, if it's beneath you, that's your self-confidence. That's your arrogance. That's your less than admirable quality that's holding you back from doing what's necessary. That your advanced knowledge is not as advanced as you might think it is. It's very limited to the scope that which you went through. And you can't show someone how smart you are until you're willing to show how much you're willing to work. And I don't 
care how much you think you know. I can assure you it's less than me. The fact that you're arrogant enough to think that probably just tells me right away I'm probably not a person that would be a good fit as an employee here because their ego or their pride would limit them from actually bringing a really good contributor to what we're asking them to do. So just to answer your question, how to be successful, like being more confident, practice preparation, but also being more aware of the job is asking you to do a job, not because it doesn't like you or think it's beneath the other coaches, because it needs to get done. And where you're at from a skill or ability or experience standpoint just makes you the best person for that job. Yeah. Awesome, Tim. This has been great. A lot of great insights on how to be a good young strength coach and, and work your way up the ladder. You got to put the time in, get those reps and, and work on that confidence. So yeah. thank you for taking the time. And it all boils back down to the why, like you said at the beginning. So a strong why really pulls everything together. No doubt. No doubt. Awesome, man. Thank you, Corey.